Today's text comes from Luke 1, 67 through 80, and this can be found on page 804 in the Pew Bibles. And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord, God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lakin. If you can find your seats. We'll go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Father, what a joy to be here in your presence to sing of your mercy and your kindness and to read about the kindness and forbearance of God throughout history, uh, to see in the lives of God followers as we try to be by your grace and are because of Christ. Uh, we see them worshiping you and rejoicing because you have met with us. Lord, they reached for you, and we reached for you this morning in joy. Uh, they knew you, Lord, and in that particular time, as was read, they saw you with their eyes, and their hands touched you, as John said. And we look through eyes of faith this morning, and we desire that our hearts and minds would be illumined, and we look forward to the day when we can be in your presence and touch the face of God. I pray that what we do here would really cause us to be weighed down uh, with our sins so they want to confess it and cause us to be strengthened and encouraged that we are reaching for the gates of heaven and not for the things of this world which will be lost. So encourage our souls and I pray for your people that are here. I ask that every home that is rep represented here, Lord, would have the joy of the Lord present in their homes and the peace that passes understanding that all who would enter into their homes might know that there is something different because a Christian lives there. I pray for favor over them, Lord Jesus. I ask that you would answer their prayers. I pray that you would give them strength in the midst of the storms in which they find themselves, whether it be because you have led them or because they've had to confess sin and they are experiencing the outcome of decisions that are contrary to who you are. Lord, have mercy upon them and give them grace. Thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ who are here. We surrender ourselves, all of us, Lord, under these prayers, knowing that if it weren't for the grace of God, we would be lost and embrace every form of sin. But you have called us by name. You have healed us through the sanctifying and powerful work of redemption in the forgiveness of sins. And we thank you for the joy that we have in you. We thank you for the assurance that we have in Christ. We thank you that we are held in the hand of God and in no other hand. So Lord, I just ask for favor upon our time this morning that you would bless it with insight and wisdom, that our hearts would be open, Lord, that you'd cleanse us all of those things that keep us from seeing your beauty and savoring your grace. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would use me as an instrument of grace to your people now so that what we see now in the meditation of the scripture would be the beauty of heaven in the face of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for every church in this city that is being faithful this morning to preach your word. Would you extend this prayer of blessing to them? Would you cause your face to shine upon them and do them good? And for every church in the city that is lost, that has lost their way and is refusing repentance, remove their influence, I pray. But give us wisdom as well during this time to know how to 
Help them see the joys that we have experienced and been encouraged by. We love you, Lord. Increase our love for you, we pray, for your glory's sake. Amen. Amen. Well, wonderful to worship with you this morning. Always a blessing to hear your voices. And as you know, the kids are with us in the service because this is the fifth Sunday. Uh, one of the things that we began uh, many years ago was uh, having the kids come into our service on the fifth Sunday for a few reasons. Uh, one is so that we could allow our uh, volunteers to have just another, an extra Sunday where they could worship with all of God's people. And the other is we think it's very important for our children to watch us worship the Lord and be affected by the God that we say they must serve and follow and love and obey. And so we want to make sure that we have these times that we can be together to worship the Lord. And really, we're following the footsteps of many, many uh, churches around the world that don't necessarily have a children's program, and everybody's there. The synagogues, for instance, where Jesus Christ would have been raised, uh, was a corporate gathering of God's people from every age to hear the Word of God. Now, we are doing something a little bit different this morning, and that is that I am, as you can see, going to borrow from the text uh, that would have been taught in our children's ministry. And so I'm going to take some of the ideas that were there. I'm going to salt it with my own stuff just because uh, I'm not a, a teacher of children in that particular age group. And so I need some other tools to help me get my mind around some of these things. And I hope it comes out clearly and for your encouragement. Our attention then is brought this morning to the birth of John the Baptist, which is what we find re right here in Luke chapter 1. Uh, which is really an amazing particular little text of Scripture that we have in Luke chapter 1. I'm going to give a 10,000-foot view because we have 80 verses here, and I'm sure you don't want to be here under me for 80 verses. So we're going to kind of take a quick look at what we have here. But we have this person introduced to us right at the very beginning after the introduction, which is verses 1 all the way through verse 4. Uh, Luke is speaking to a gentleman named Theophilus. He's a man of position, as we can in, um, understand from the, t the title that's given him, Most Excellent Theophilus. And then it goes into... Uh, this birth announcement, if you will, of John the Baptist. Well, who was John the Baptist? What was John the Baptist like? We're actually uh, really blessed with quite a lot of information of all the things that we can know about John the Baptist. Many people we don't know much information about in the, in the scriptures, but we do know quite a bit about John the Baptist. He was, uh, he was uh, a fellow that lived out in the wilderness by the Jordan River. He was really a strong, hard, you know, tough a person, but also very gentle. Jesus calls him the greatest of men that lived. That's a pretty amazing statement that John was given, or a title that John was given by, by, by Jesus. Uh, we know as well that uh, he called Herod out, the king, the Jewish king, uh, that he had broken the law of God by marrying his brother Philip's wife. And all John said was, it is not lawful for you to have your brother Philip's wife. The influence that John had caused Herod to actually um, take John into custody, and eventually we find out about John's martyrdom because of um, his concern over faithfulness, and Herod's wife uh, did not want him around, calling her out on the carpet on their sin. So it's pretty interesting to see his life and his story. We have some information that's also kind of odd if we think about it, and this is kind of fun for our children and for me as well. We're told about what he dressed in, which is interesting. Uh, we're told that he wore camel's hair, and it was not like we would find here, right? This is, uh, this is some nice woven camel's hair that we can find here. Uh, camel's, um, uh, what am I looking for? What they do with sheep? Uh, wool, thank you. That's the word I'm looking for. Uh, we probably have more of this picture that we have to do with John the Baptist. He was a little bit more rugged and a little bit more um, uh, of a stronger man with these things. He wasn't soft. Jesus says, we, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? To see a man dressed in soft clothing? And he says, no, but here's John the Baptist. And we're also, of all things, we're told about his diet, which is pretty interesting. Now, children, this is uh, my apologies to you. I desired to actually buy a couple bags of this stuff that John the Baptist ate, but then I got worried that your parents would be mad at me and mostly worried that they would want me to eat some too. Uh, if you remember, John the Baptist ate wild honey, not a bad thing, but he was also very fond of crickets. Uh, locust is what was on the menu for John throughout the, his time there in the wilderness, which is an interesting little tidbit of information. Uh, I, I really love the Spanish on this. I think it would go a lot better and it would, it would just sound tastier if 
We use the, the literal Spanish translation, which in Spanish is saltamontes, literally mountain hopper. That sounds better than cricket, doesn't it? Or locust, it at least sounds like an animal that can uh, have some damage if you don't take him out. It sounds strong and manly. Uh, anyway, all that being said, this is John the Baptist's uh, food. Now, just think about this for a minute. Because of all the things that you would say in a historical piece, which is Luke and the Gospel writers, there's a very narrow window of information that you can give. Why would you spend time speaking about the things that he wore and the things that he ate? And really, it's to show the kind of person that John the Baptist was. Uh, he probably was very poor if this was the clothing that he had. He probably was very poor if he had to basically look around for locusts to eat and find little beehives, uh, wild beehives, to be able to get the honey from them. But we also see in John the Baptist a strength that was pretty incredible. He served the Lord with a kind of integrity that affected the entire population of Israel at that time. Everyone knew who John the Baptist was. And even Herod the king was worried about how he was going to interact with John. He didn't like what John was saying, and he wanted to put him to death, but he feared the people. And ultimately, because of this oath that he had given in front of many of his friends, he had to fulfill this death sentence upon John the Baptist. John the Baptist was an amazing, an amazing person, to be sure, and I look forward to meeting him. He was a truth teller. He was not about himself, as you can see by the clothing. He wasn't worried about what he looked like. But one of the greatest statements of a leader in his time who had an immense amount of influence was a statement that you and I as Christians should take to heart just as we get into the introduction of this particular section. And that is what he says about Jesus when he's asked about or told about the fact that Jesus' disciples were baptizing more disciples than he was. And he says, he must increase and I must decrease. What an amazing statement of how the Christian life should be, that the preeminence of Jesus Christ and everything that we are and do should be manifest and that we would find our identity in him so that he becomes greater and greater and greater in the visage in which we portray. And so we're brought into this particular section, which is really a wonderful section of scripture. Uh, we're told about this amazing story of John the Baptist and, and then also with uh, Jesus Christ. And so let's begin just with a look at what the Bible is doing generally. Uh, and we really see this in this particular section in spades. So the Bible is a book about God and then about how we respond or how we interact with God. I do believe that's very important if you just consider if we come back all the way to Genesis chapter 1. What do we have? In the beginning, God, and then God decides to create. God is, and he creates, and then there's an interaction with his creation. Genesis chapter 3, God decides to have mercy upon those who had sinned against him. Genesis chapter 8 and 9, God provides a means of grace from, uh, by escape from his judgment when he rains down fire, uh, or excuse me, when he uh, floods the earth. Genesis chapter 15, God introduces a covenant with mankind through Abraham, and he swears by himself that he will be the one who follows that covenant. That's amazing. Abraham is kept off to the side, and God takes upon himself all the curses of the covenant if he doesn't fulfill his promises, which ultimately, my friends, are promises of salvation upon which you and I stand thousands of years later and upon which you and I find our hope and joy. Exodus through Malachi, God sends prophets to tell people that he would come and rescue his people from hardships. God is constantly commuting to his people, but God is the primary initiator of conversation, the primary communicator of truth, the primary revealer of his self. And then we get to Matthew chapter 1, Matthew ch or Mark chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, and John chapter 1, and what do we see? God with us. And the story of God's mercy revealing his power and his grace through the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible is a book about God, to be sure. And secondarily, a book of how man responds to God. And there really is an encouragement in that because we can see in the pages of the scriptures many people that look like us and sound like us in the way we communicate to God. And we can see the paths of grace that they have found and reach for those ourselves. But I would encourage you with this as well, that the Bible is a book about God, and then, as I've said, a book about how we interact with God, which ultimately we have to see is based upon how God demands our interaction with him. 
You see, you and I don't just get to show up and decide how we're going to interact with God. That's kind of a human thing, right? You've got to take me as I am, God. And he does take us as I am in order to change us, not to leave us where we are. But if you think about how relationships are incited in our culture today, that's like, hey, don't ever try to change me. This is who I am. It's almost a God-like statement that we're making. We're basically declaring that there's nothing in us that needs to be changed when we say those kinds of things. And there's really only one person that can say that, and so we're brought to an understanding of who God is and our first understanding of the terms that he requires of us, and that is that he is God and we are not. The scriptures are very clear, and we can show you a few here as I've shown you on the slide. Psalm chapter 1, 11 and verse 10, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 and 9, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of, win of insight and wisdom. Uh, the scriptures toggle back and forth between those particular words, wisdom or insight or the knowledge that we have of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of insight or the beginning of wisdom. And it really drives us to a place of understanding. John the Baptist was a person who feared the Lord. He served him. His parents were people who feared the Lord, as we see from the text. And the question as we consider the entire scope of scripture and then this particular little section where God reaches down into our lives with his own person, do we fear the Lord? If we consider what the gospel says, that God broke through into creation, that Jesus Christ took upon himself, Philippians chapter 2, the form of a man, and humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, and rose again. If we think about a God who has that kind of power, to not reduce his identity as God, and yet take on the smallness and the brokenness of mankind, and live a life in brokenness, yet without sin, so that he could rescue us from sin. If we think about that kind of power, of all the things that should induce fear and concern, that should be one. We don't play with this God. He is a good God. But he's not our genie in the bottle that we get to decide how we're going to interact with him. Do you fear the Lord, my friends? And this is really seen in how we actually respond in our lives to him. Are we considered of the fact that he is constantly present with us? Term number one, he is God and, he, and we are not. Term number two, we recognize our need. God is holy and we are outside of his provision of Christ. Uh, and, and we, outside of his provision of Christ's sanctifying work, are not holy. God has to do a work in us. Romans chapter 3, 23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Psalm 51, 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. John chapter 3, verse 19. And this is the judgment that light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their works were evil. You see, this is basically what Luke is going to get us to. It's not just the birth of John the Baptist. He wants to show us how God is working through the life of this one person to move us to the very reality of what Christ has done in order to set us free from the bondage of sin. This is difficult because when we consider that, we really see that there is a long shadow cast over our souls that can only be removed by the beautiful and glorious and powerful light of God. Do you know him? Do you love him? Do you seek his face as he should be sought? We recognize that he is God and we are not. We recognize our need of God. And the other thing I think as we consider the terms and we come into this particular section of scripture is that God has provided the means through which we can have a relationship with him and that is through his son, Jesus Christ. That's very important. We see this in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. Do you see it? God first, and then there's this action uh, that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. In other words, God has provided a means for us to interact with him. God first, and then us. John eleven twenty five. 25. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then the glorious question of Jesus Christ, because his life is not just here as an example. It is an example. His life is not just here as, as, a, as a manifestation of God's power and glory. His life is here to cause a question in our souls. Do you believe this about me? Do you believe the things that we are saying, that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are saying about ourselves and about you? Do you believe that I am the resurrection and the life? And so just as we get into this particular section, I think it's important to understand uh, who Jesus is to us. Uh, what kind of influence does he have in our life? Is Jesus 
an example or is he our life and grace and mercy from God? Is Jesus a good person or is he God, which is the intent of this particular section as we move into it? I would encourage you to consider the state of your soul because this is essentially what Paul or what Luke is doing here in this particular section. He wants to introduce this reality of who Jesus Christ is to this gentleman named Theophilus. And he really is standing upon the shoulders of what thousands of years of history of God followers have said about God. And so I will draw your attention now to the second section that we want to look at. And that is that not only is the Bible a book about God, but we have to ask this question, how does John the Baptist's life reflect this principle of God first then our response to God second. It's kind of a formula that God establishes in the Scripture. And we see this really in the organization of the writing here in Luke uh, chapter 1 all the way through the end of his book. It's pretty simple. Luke chapter 1, there's an introduction to the reader, and as we are apt to do as Americans, we got to cut the name short, right? Theophilus, let's just make it Theo. It makes it a little easier. Intro to the reader, most excellent Theophilus, Theo. And then we have this parallel that Luke introduces to us. So there's John the Baptist and Jesus Christ, and they're set, connected, even though chronologically they're months apart, the birth stories of Jesus and John the Baptist. He wants us to see what God is doing, how God is interacting in this world so that we can be rescued, and then ultimately that rescuing is God and redemption. His revelation of himself is not just to exemplify his holiness, but to magnify his mercy and his grace, which is what we see in this particular section. And so we consider Luke chapter 1, for instance. So if you've got your Bibles opened up there to Luke chapter 1, look at verses 1 all the way through verse 4. There's this interaction that Luke is taking, is interacting with, with Theophilus. It seems good to me, verse 3, also, having followed these things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account to you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. In other words, there's already information, there's already been an encounter with the truth of who God is. And now Luke is taking Theophilus through a point where he can respond to the reality of who Jesus is, which he's going to show us in a moment is the expression of God to us here upon this earth. It's pretty amazing if you think about how all of this works through. Now, I want to highlight something very important. Look at what he says. Uh, and as much as I have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me, verse 3, uh, having followed all things closely, Fast forward to write an orderly account. I need to pause here for a second because we can skip right over this. And I want to remind you in the scriptures, there is a, uh, there is a teaching called the inspiration of the scriptures. That is that God breathes out his scriptures. But just want to show quickly, because I know this isn't necessarily the focus of our passage, but just to encourage you with some really beautiful biblical truths that are here. In this particular section, we see Luke is actually taking time being led by the Holy Spirit to study the things that have taken place. Inspiration, John, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, God breathes out his word uh, through his people, all scriptures inspired by God, and is profitable for correction, instruction, reproof, uh, and unrighteousness, all these different kinds of things that we can see in that section. Paul, or Luke, excuse me, is showing us that he is being used by God through his effort. Inspiration is not mechanical. It's not like God got a hold of Luke and it's like, okay, just me, you know? Just let that stuff just come out on this quill and this ink. It takes thought. It takes prayer. It takes concern and commitment to the things that the Lord wants us to see and to understand. And he fills that work for his glory. I would encourage you because if you have a, have a bad view of inspiration, you're going to have a bad view of really the hope that we have of Jesus Christ. And there will be nothing that really anchor your soul. If you want some more teaching on inspiration, the texts that are there uh, are important. I leave that for you for your own study. But let's just get back to our text for a moment as we're kind of following Luke's train of thought uh, as we're looking at this particular section. From the introduction of seeing how he is forming, God has done something. I'm telling you of the history of what God has done, and now I'm pointing you to Jesus Christ and what he is going to do and how you might understand what he's already done in this life, his birth, death, and resurrection so that we can have life and encouragement. And then he moves into this interaction of John the Baptist's parents, his dad and his mom, and this angel Gabriel, which is really a fascinating story. I would encourage you to spend some time reading it and later on. 
uh, when you get home. This is ver verse 5 all the way through verse 24. Zechariah is a priest, and it's his turn now to go to the temple and to serve. You can go back to the Old Testament to see how the distribution and the organization of priests took place in that time. Uh, it was his time to serve, and he is... He has been chosen by lot to see who, you know, they would basically, priests would get together, who's the one that's going to go in the back uh, and, and uh, minister for us on our behalf, and they would draw straws, and then whoever that got the short straw, that's the person that would go in. Zechariah is there, and he's serving the Lord. Uh, now, just to encourage you, uh, the, the understanding of Scripture and the concept of God's sovereignty in all things is seen even in the drawing of straws. We see that all the way through Scripture. Uh, and so you want to take some time studying that particular thing on your own as well. But there's Zechariah, and he's minding his own business. The Scripture tells us that he's actually older. He's advanced in years, the Scriptures say, in this particular section. And then Gabriel comes and he says, basically, joy to you, and your prayers have been answered. He's probably wondering what in the world prayer has been answered. I mean, he was serving and ministering for the prayers of the people at that time. But what prayer, and specifically the prayer that is mentioned is the prayer for a son or a daughter, a child. It's fascinating, really, if you think about it. His age and God's work and all of these kinds of things, determining that at this time in his life that he and his wife would actually bear children. Uh, it shows us a lot about what we've already talked about that God's in charge, that he is sovereign, and he can choose to use even the hardships of life to magnify his name and fulfill and satisfy his glory at the appropriate time. And it really is an encouragement for you and for me to rest in the midst of our storms and hardships. You see, what God was planning to do through Zechariah and Elizabeth was to use his son, their son, John the Baptist, in a way that no one in history could ever be used and would ever be used again. That he would be the one to prepare the way for Jesus Christ. And this is amazing, and it teaches us not only of God's sovereignty, that God just can decide to use hardship and then satisfy that need uh, for a good thing, like a son or a daughter, in his own time. John the Baptist uh, was given as a gift to them later on, and what they were being shown is that God was really using their pain to prepare for their son, and then ultimately as well for a blessing for the world. And this should encourage you and me as Christians, because we have to remember that God, who is outside of all of this, who sovereignly manifests his work in us, even in the hardships of life, is the one who will always bring redemption through that pain. I don't know where you are or what kinds of struggles are upon your shoulders. I know living in this life long enough, you will find that there is a whole bag of troubles that we seem to find ourselves in. And you as a Christian don't rest upon a God who is silent or a God who is ignorant of your need. You rest upon a God who actually manifests his power and his glory by using the hardships of this life to determine your goodness through the glorification of his person. Your encouragement through the manifestation of his grace through you. John the Baptist, you're going to be born to old parents. Old parents, you're going to have a kid. Your prayer has finally been answered. And then obviously we see later on in this section, Elizabeth, overjoyed. The reproach of not being able to have a child was removed from her. People would just be amazed at what God was doing. It's an amazing passage of Scripture, and it's showing us that God moves on our behalf for His glory and for our good in His time. Are you resting in that? Are you trusting His design for His mercies to be bestowed upon you and His grace to be bestowed upon you? Now, as you can intimate from the title that I had in the message concerning the deity of Jesus Christ. I think one of the important things that we have to take from this passage, which is really the central component of this passage, is the prophecy that this man, this young child in his time would prepare the way of the Lord, tells us something about who this Jesus Christ is and what he was and is to the world. You see, that particular statement that we find in this reading in Luke chapter uh, one comes from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, that the Lord would come to his people, that he would prepare the way of the Lord, that the one who would come would prepare the way of the Lord. In the Old Testament, especially in English translations, you'll see it as in all caps, that word Lord, 
which is a statement about, which is a, uh, the actual name for God, which is his covenant name for God. That is Jehovah, L-O-R-D. Uh, it's a te the Tetragrammaton is what they call it. It's the holy name of God. Uh, the scribes would take great pains to make sure that even as they were writing that particular name, they were very careful and there was a system of things that they would do. This, this, is, a, this is a major statement that the scriptures make. Because what it is ascribing to Jesus Christ through the prophecy to John and of John is that Jesus Christ is Jehovah. Do you see that in the scriptures? That he would prepare the way of the Lord and the Lord is Yahweh. Jesus Christ is Yahweh. And not just Yahweh, but he is the covenant one. The one who will fulfill his covenant promises to you and to me. The one who stood before Abraham and kept Abraham at bay and took upon him all the curses of the promises of saying that he would fulfill all that was necessary for that blessing to come. Which is Jesus Christ who redeems us from sin. And so our formula is seen again by the fact that God moves on his own terms and for his own glory. That we might be strengthened in him. That we might be encouraged in and by him. This is an amazing grace that God has given us by seeing that it isn't just some good person that is going to come and tell us about God. It isn't just someone who's a good example. It is God himself who has come down to this earth to rescue us from our pain and suffering. And that, that ultimate rescuing comes not by just removing our pain. John chapter 17, and this is eternal life that they may know you. Our peace, my friends, is in the knowing of God intimately through his son, Jesus Christ. So the distinction of Christ in this world is even elevated to a greater height. Now we have, obviously, in Luke chapter 1, this foretelling. As I said, there's these parallel stories. John, uh, Luke mentions in uh, Luke 1, uh, verse 26, uh, this encounter that Gabriel now has with the Virgin Mary and, and basically the interaction that he has with her and the joy that is going to come. And then we have in Luke chapter 1, verse 39, this interaction that Mary has with, with uh, Elizabeth, her relative. Uh, and let me just highlight something, especially concerning uh, uh, something that's kind of a peripheral in our culture, but it's very important. Look at what Elizabeth says about hearing the voice of Mary, when she came to him, when she came to her that day. For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that this would be a fulfillment of what the Lord has spoken. It says a lot, my friends, about what it means to have a child in you, ladies, that they can actually interact with what is and some level with what is being heard. And this is actually given to us by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It says that the Spirit filled Elizabeth, and then she spoke these things. And as those Christians, it's not just the identity and the dignity of person in the womb, the unborn, as being human that we're concerned about. But we're concerned about the fact that these are real, viable lives with personalities that are developing and growing. We want to magnify the Lord by how we treat them, not only in concerns about abortion, for instance, but also in what we take in in our lives while these kids are developing in the womb. She heard the sound of Mary and the baby leap for joy. And so my encouragement to you, especially who are expecting children, fill your mind and your heart and your ears with all the truth of God's beauty and joy. Because we were told of John the Baptist that he would be filled from the moment of conception with the Holy Spirit. What an amazing grace it would be to be able to just have that opportunity to all of us as Christians to be able to share with our children, even in utero, the grace that God bestows, or bestows upon us through Christ. So what have we seen, really? We've seen God's sovereignty in choosing these two old people. We've seen God's election in saying, hey, by the way, I'm choosing John the Baptist. We're not having a committee. Okay, John, you don't get, I mean, but there's just like from the womb, you are chosen to be this person for my son. And then we see Jesus Christ coming and magnifying his grace and his mercy. And it goes into this harmony of really declaring God's power and authority to us. 
We see Jesus Christ being, uh, or we see Mary, excuse me, magnifying the reality of Christ in the Magnificat. And so here's the second part, uh, the prayers and the, and the blessings that are manifest, not only through Mary, but then also through Zechariah in verse 67, that what was read for us by Lakin this morning. And I want to highlight just something from both of these things that underscore what we have been saying already, okay? And then we're going to close. Verse 46, and Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in my God, for he has looked upon the humble estate. Verse 67, and, the, and his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and raised up a horn of salvation. You see what's happening? God moved, and God's people responded. Loved ones, how are you responding to the reality and the glory that the God of heaven has saved your soul. Are you stirred by that? Are you as willing as Zachariah, Elizabeth, and Mary, and John the Baptist to receive whatever hardships are necessary? Because it means not only that you will glorify the Lord and taste his goodness, but that others will hear of his glorious name through you. You see, here's the cool part. John the Baptist, filled with the Holy Spirit from the room, to prepare the way of the Lord and after Jesus Christ rises from the dead, he breathes upon his followers and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now go and share my name before others. John, prepare the way. God's people, go and tell of the way. Will you seek him? Will you serve him? Will you honor him as the King of kings and Lord of lords? He is God, the Son of God most high who has delivered us from sin. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for things that are greater than our understanding. Thank you for the beauty that you have left us in words through men like Luke and other gospel writers. Thank you for faithful people like Elizabeth and Mary and Zechariah, even in repentance for not believing. Thank you for people like John the Baptist who serve so faithfully. Make us, Lord, like those who have gone before and served you with dignity that we might serve you well in our time of our sojourning here on this earth for your glory, we pray. Amen.